So hi guys and welcome to lesson 4 of the geochemical data series. In this lesson I'm going to be giving you an introduction to mineral chemistry. So a mineral is a naturally occurring inorganic substance. Substitution is a reaction whereby ions of similar size and charge can replace other ions in a crystal lattice. So think back to uh, calcium 2 plus and europium 2 plus in the rare earth element presentation. And then we have solid solution, which is a mixture of two or more minerals that can display a range of compositions in a single crystal lattice. And I'll elaborate more on this in the following slides. And then we have exolution, which is a process whereby an initially homogeneous solid solution becomes unstable and separates into two different minerals without the addition or removal of materials. And I'll elaborate on that later as well. So minerals can form in a few ways, the most common of which being crystallization from a liquid, i.e. a magma or lava. Secondly, precipitation from a fluid, such as a hydrothermal fluid exolved from a granite. Three, uh, sublimination of from a vapor, so think to things like black smokers. And four, from solid-solid reactions, which occurs in response to physical changes, uh, such as metamorphism or diagenesis. So elements can bond in a few ways. Uh, firstly, we have what's known as covalent bonds, whereby two atoms can share electrons. Uh, and here's an example of, of two atoms sharing two valence electrons here. And a common example of this is water or H2O. Secondly, we have ionic bonds, which is the transfer of valence electrons. So electrons in the outer shell of that element uh, between the atoms. And this is the bonding of positively charged cations and negatively charged anions. And a good example of this is sodium and chlorine, chlorine being the anion and uh, sodium being the cation. And they exchange electrons like this. And then we have metallic bonds, whereby we have a, a group of positively charged metal ions uh, metal cations uh, that sit in a negatively charged electron cloud and uh, this is sort of exemplified in this nice little animation here where we have electrons that are freely moving around between the metal cations. So solid solution arises from substitution of ions in a single crystal lattice and there are a few ways we can do this. So firstly we have substitution or straight swap so ions of a similar size and charge can swap for one another in a single crystal lattice. So let's give an example. What we have then is we have end members. So if we give the example of olivine, we have two end members. We have um, purely magnesium rich olivine, which is known as forstrite. And then we have purely iron olivine, which is known as phaolite. And these two phases form a solid solution in that we can have a mixture of both magnesium and iron in an olivine anywhere in between these two end members. Secondly, we have what's known as coupled substitution, whereby ions of different charges swap. And because they have different charges, a second swap will need to be made to balance the charge in the two phases. And a good example of this is in the plagioclase solid solution series, whereby we have a calcium rich plagioclase known as anorthite, and then we have sodium rich plagioclase known as albite. Uh, in the anorthite, anorthosite being a rock composed of purely anorthite, so apologies for that. So in the anorthite, we have uh, calcium as the end member, so it's calcium-rich plagioclase. So what we would have to do is we would replace calcium 2 plus by sodium 1 plus. And because we, because, you know, sodium is 1 plus and calcium is 2 plus, we have to complete a second substitution. So we would replace an aluminium 3 plus with a silicon 4 plus element to balance the charge. And that's why we have two aluminium ions here and two silicon ions here. Whereas in albite, we have one aluminium ion and three silicon ions. And thirdly, we have some other different types of solid solution, whereby we have what's known as emission solid solution, whereby a higher charge ion replaces two lower charge ions. And we have interstitial solid solution, whereby ions occupy voids or spaces in crystal lattices. So X solution is a process whereby a phase that is initially in solid solution will become unstable due to changes in conditions and it will try to separate into two different solid phases. But because these are solids and not liquids, the process of separation is quite difficult. So instead of forming two individual phases, we form what's known as X solution lamellae. So we have X solution lamellae of one phase that's been dissolved within a larger phase. Um, and a common example of this is in granites. So in granites, we have uh, typically alkali or plagioclase feldspar uh, phenocrysts. So we have quite large feldspars. So if we take a large alkali feldspar, we can exhibit what's known as perthites or perthitic texture. And what that is, is we have our alkali feldspar and within it, we have ex-solution lamellae of plagioclase. 
uh, and this is essentially um, all the calcium and sodium escaping from that crystal lattice of alkali feldspar because it's no longer compatible within the alkali feldspar lattice. So this is what we're seeing in this photomicrograph here. We have ex-solution lamellae of plagioclase within a large alkali feldspar. The opposite of this would be antiperthites, which is uh, we have plagioclase phenocrysts and then ex-solution lamellae of K-feldspar. There are some other examples of this in geology, iron oxides being another common one where we have things like magnetite, titanomagnetite or ilmenite exolutions in one another. Uh, and there's obviously a several other examples as well. So we can calculate the composition of phases through some fairly simple calculations. Uh, so first, if we take a look at olivine up here, um, we can calculate what's known as the Forsterite or Thayerite number, Forsterite being FO, Thayerite being FA, and essentially the calculation for magnesium number, where we calculate molar magnesium divided by molar iron plus magnesium multiplied by 100. And then we can generate olivines anywhere on this spectrum here, where we have two end members. We have 100% iron here, as you can see by that formula, in what's known as thayerite. Then 100% magnesium, FO, in what's known as forsterite. And then we can have a spectrum of different olivine compositions in between. And we typically, when a magma crystallizes and it is olivine saturated, it will precipitate uh, the most magnesium rich olivine. Um, and typically the most magnesium rich olivines that could be produced in nature is around 93% um, percent forced right. So what we can see here, so if we had a spot here, which we do in this example, we have 80% forced right or 20% thayerite. So this would typically be denoted as FO80, and that's the result of this calculation here. If we take pyroxenes, we're adding a third end member. So not only do we have the solid solution series here between magnesium and iron, we've thrown calcium into the mix. So we have instatite down here, we have wollastonite up here, and we have ferrocylate down here. And then we have another solid solution in the middle for our clonopyroxenes. So the calculation operates exactly the same as forstrite, except we've also added in calcium. And then we would analyze our minerals and they would plot somewhere within this ternary diagram. And then we would be able to determine the type of pyroxene that we've analyzed. Here we have um, sort of gaps uh, whereby there's no natural occurring phases in nature. And that brings us on to feldspars. Um, so similar to pyroxenes, we display it as a ternary diagram, but as you see, they're slightly different, as in we have what's known as the miscibility gap. So firstly, we have a norphite down here, which is our calcium-rich end member. We have albite down here, which is our sodium-rich end member. And we have alkali feldspar up here, which is our potassium-rich end member. As you can see, there's solid solution between a norphite and albite, as has been discussed previously, which is known as the plagioclase series. And we have solid solution between albite and alkali feldspar, which is known as our alkali feldspar series. However, we do not have solid solution between alkali feldspar and plagioclase, and that gives rise to this miscibility gap, where there is no stable assemblage in nature. And because of this, there is no solid solution between an orthite and orthoclase. So now we can produce equations just as we did for pyroxene and olivine to see where our analyzed feldspar would pop on this ternary diagram. If we just wanted to calculate the series here, so if we just wanted to calculate plagioclase feldspar series, we would carry out this equation. So rather than incorporating potassium, we would actually do two times sodium plus calcium, which is what we often see when we're looking at a mineral chemistry studies in igneous petrology. However, if we wanted to plot them onto this diagram, we would operate just in the same way as we did for the pyroxene diagram, whereby we would have potassium plus sodium plus calcium. So thank you for listening. I hope you found this helpful. Stay in the loop by clicking subscribe and hopefully see you guys in the next lesson.